He's a kind of old friend, I think. Uh, I could say now, Jack. Will you? I mean, I, I guess I've known you for a, what about fifteen years? Is it now? Fourteen. I think so. Yeah. Yeah. Around day. Yeah. So, so welcome to this Birkbeck event. Um, and um, you're now teaching, of course. You're 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 a professor in the at the National University of Singapore. As indeed I see your first slide says, and we've also got your title there, but you started out, I mean started out, but you did, did your PhD at Berkeley, uh, that famous program which uh, seems, seems to have produced a lot of people who are you know, quite prominent now, or getting to prominence in our field now. Um, and um, I guess your, your first book was effective, effectively your your PhD thesis, wasn't it? Um, yes, absolutely. Uh, yeah, and you published that in 2016 with the title "A Genealogy of Tropical Architecture, Colonial Networks, Nature, and Neuroscience." And I think that's an important book. I mean, it sort of revised my thinking about the field and where future research could go. Um, and um, well, welcome, and we've got your title here, so let's just pass it to you. Sure. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mark. Um, indeed, I think we, we have known each other for a long time, and I've always seen you as a, as a mentor. So it's, it's good to um, be invited by you um, to, 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 to be talking about my latest research. So thanks, Mark, again. So um, what I'm going to present today is a work in progress on the transnational history of air conditioning and the built environment in urban Asia. Um, currently, the research involves two cases, one in the Arabian Gulf and the other in Southeast Asia. I plan to add at least one more case in East Asia later, um, later meaning when the pandemic is over and when we can travel to do field and archival research. So the title for this talk is taken from my study of Doha, the Arabian Gulf case. In this talk, I'll be discussing Doha in relation to Singapore and a broader set of conceptual issues of dealing with air conditioning and the built environment. Before I do that, I thought I should signpost my lecture with an outline. There are six parts to this lecture. I begin with two surveys of the air conditioned landscapes in Doha and Singapore. By exploring these two understudied cities that are addicted to air conditioning, I hope to broaden the geography and expand our discussion of the histories and futures of climate, architecture, and society. After the two surveys, I situate them in the context of the recent discussion on the looming coal crunch, which is the projected social environmental crisis that will be produced by a combination of climate change and the rampant growth in air conditioning in the global south. I'm concerned with the looming coal crunch too, but I disagree with the ways in which the problems has been disaggregated and the type of technocentric solutions that are currently being proposed and implemented. Instead of disaggregating the problem and taking a technocentric approach, I suggest that we look at three types of interdependencies in the air conditioning complex. The three parts of the lecture, regimes of discomfort, examples of architectural enclosure, and thermal material entanglements sketch out these interdependencies. So let us start with Doha. Located in Doha Old Center, Musharraf Downtown Doha is a development that combines state-of-the-art sustainability technologies with inspiration drawn from the traditional urban fabric of an quote-unquote Arab city. Unlike the rest of modern Doha, Musharraf is a development made up of well-shaded narrow streets, small squares and courtyards. Partly open recently, it is envisioned as a pedestrian-friendly environment that provides environmentally comfortable outdoor public spaces that would evoke the sociability and the conviviality of the idealized urban spaces from the region's past. For the project, the architects and engineers came up with a combination of what Rainer Benham calls structural solution, such as the shading provided by the urban fabric with low energy power operated solution again a term from Benham, that combines radiant cooling and soft conditioning using partially cool and dehumidified air for keeping users comfortable in the outdoor and semi-outdoor spaces. Musharraf Downtown Doha is a major project developed by a subsidiary of Qatar Foundation, which is chaired by Sheikha Moza bin Nasser, 
the consort of the former Emir of Qatar, and for many years the face of Qatar's cultural diplomacy and soft power. Located in Doha's old city called the Musharraf downtown Doha represents both an attempt at reducing, if not reversing, the urban sprawl of Doha and moving away from the Qatari norm of building climatically inappropriate and energy profligate architecture, or what a commentator called grass refrigerators in the desert. Other than Musharraf downtown Doha, Doha's old city core currently consists of primarily the Emil Palace, Souq Waqif, and a number of older neighborhoods occupied mainly by low-income migrant workers. There is almost no Qatari living there, and that is a result of state planning, of state urban planning and housing policies from the 1970s. After Qatar became independent in 1971, a number of master plans were commissioned. The first was produced in 1972 by the British firm Llewellyn Davis. It made three major recommendations that shaped subsequent urban development in, in Doha. First, it recommended that the state acquire and clear the houses in the neighborhoods of the old city core to free up land for development. Second, it draw out a system of ring and radial roads from the city outwards, bringing about suburbanization. Third, it proposed land reclamation of a large area of salt marshes and tidal flats to the northeast of the city to create a new urban district. The first and second recommendations were accepted by the state and they saw them as means to redistribute oil revenues to Qataris and gain political legitimacy. Qataris were generously compensated for houses and land acquired, often at inflated rates due to speculation, and provided plots in the suburbs and interest-free loans to build new houses. These changes led to a shift towards carbon-intensive lifestyle, as most Qatari relocated from traditional yard-oriented houses in the old city core to air-conditioned modern villas in the outlying suburbs. Furthermore, suburbanization created automobile dependency. Land acquisition in the old city core, however, took much longer and costed much more than estimated. A significant proportion of the land cleared remained vacant and undeveloped for many years. As the program ran out of funds and ended prematurely, many of the older houses continue to remain there till today. However, most Qataris moved out of these houses to live in the suburbs, and these houses were subdivided and leased to migrant workers, as we shall see. The third recommendation was fully and swiftly implemented because land reclamation could create new land free from the constraints of existing private ownership. The American architecture firm William L. Pallera and Associates was commissioned to plan the new district that became today's West Bay, a commercial and financial area filled with skyscraper. In terms of both architecture and urban design, it is obvious that Musharraf downtown Doha and West Bay form a striking contrast. While the energy efficient buildings and Musharraf have solid and heavy envelopes with small openings shaded from the desert sun, the energy profligate skyscrapers at West Bay have thin, light and reflective glass cladding exposed to the sun. Whereas the spaces between buildings at Musharraf are well shaded and designed to be used by pedestrians as streets and squares, the spaces between buildings at West Bay are meant primarily for cars, designed as parking lots and roads. This architecture and urban contrast point to fundamental differences in thermodynamics. If one zooms out into the immediate surrounding of Musharraf and see the Al Ashmaq neighborhood to the south, another type of contrast comes into focus, despite the formal and spatial similarities consisting of a mixture of yard oriented houses and climate responsive modernist buildings from the mid 20th century, the Al Ashmaq neighborhood is essentially the urban fabric that the incomplete land acquisition and clearance program of the 1970s left behind. To a certain extent, the traditional urbanism of narrow and well shaded alleyways and the architecture of solid exterior walls with small and typically screen opening at Al Ashmaq are what the architects and planner of Mushara are trying to recreate. But the social economic statuses of the two neighborhoods could not be more different. Mushara downtown Doha is a flagship development of Qatar Foundation. 
its commercial spaces are managed by luxury hotel chains and leased out to major retail brands. And the tenants targeted for its residential developments are wealthy expatriates and affluent locals. By comparison, the houses at Al Ashma are, are subdivided and rented out cheaply to male migrant laborers earning low wages. The social economic differences are hinted in the material culture. Buildings at Al Ashma tend to be dilapidated and dirty, a result of decades of short term tenancies and neglect by the landlords. DIY modification by the inhabitants were often made to create more living space, and window unit air conditioners were added to make the congested spaces more livable. Musharraf, on the other hand, consists of meticulously detailed and carefully proportioned cream colored buildings aesthetically coordinated by leading European architectural firms, such as Ellis and Morrison, featuring the world's largest collection of certified green buildings in a single development. The sustainability features in energy, water, and waste management were carefully integrated into the development by teams of engineering consultants from large multinational firms such as AECOM and Arab. Despite the differences in architecture and urban planning and urban metabolism in terms of energy and resource use, Musharraf is a continuation of the social segmentation and spatial segregation that characterize contemporary Doha. Located below Musharraf is one of the world's largest metro stations and the hub of Doha metro system, where three different metro lines intersect and where soccer fans are expected to change train to move between eight different stadia hosting the 2022 FIFA World Cup. Two of the World Cup stadia were recently completed, Khalifa International Stadium and Al Jannab Stadium. Specially designed air conditioning system were installed in these buildings to keep the spectators comfortable and the sportsperson from potential heat injuries that Qatar summer high temperature might inflict. Although the 2022 FIFA World Cup has been moved to winter due to concerns with Qatar's sweltering summer's climate. The Qatar World Cup Organizing Committee continued with their plan to install air conditioning system for the stadium. Dr. Saul Abdul Ghani, the Qatar University professor, who was behind the implementation of the air conditioning technology for the stadium, described the air conditioned stadium as, quote, microclimate control bubbles, unquote. The bubble metaphor is an apt one, but these are not just environmental bubbles, but also social temporal ones that protect only the end users after the completion of the stadium, but not the migrant construction workers who built them. As Amnesty International and Human Rights Watch have revealed through their investigation, the migrant workers that built this stadium labored under highly exploitative contractual terms that curtail their freedoms and pay them incredibly low wages. Furthermore, they live in squalid labor camps and many suffer and even die from heat stroke, dehydration, and other heat related injuries when working without adequate protection under extremely hot conditions. Qatar architecture and urbanism of comfort and discomfort could be understood in relation to the circulation of hydrocarbons. The oil boom in the 1970s and the state's redistribution of surplus petrol dollars through land acquisition housing subsidies and urban development were part of the broader conversion of crude oil in the ground into petrol dollars. And the redistribution of these petrol dollars in carbon intensive form of welfare provision in education, healthcare, housing and employment, mostly with the ambient entitlement of air conditioning. As historian Toby Jones has noted, one of the major sources of political authority of the regimes in the Gulf states stem from their ability to provide their populations physical relief from the perils of desert life. Access to this state and Dao comfort is however restricted to the nationals and kept unattainable for most who cannot gain citizenship. The bodies of non-national, particularly the low wage migrant workers, were and still are incorporated into the circuits of hydrocarbon in vastly different manners, as we saw earlier. 
Such asymmetrical access to thermal comfort is probably most accentuated in the high-profile enclavic mega projects like the World Cup Stadium and Mashara. These two ambitious post 2000s development could likewise be seen in relation to another hydrocarbon boom that brought in unprecedented level of surplus to Qatar. It allowed the Qatari state to invest heavily in new experiments of diversifying its economy and hedging against possible post oil future. Both Musharraf and the World Cup Stadium are high profile attempts at decarbonizing Qatar's economy while simultaneously gaining international recognition. But these decarbonizing efforts were financed by hydrocarbon export, and they only served to further entrench existing social political order and spatial atmospheric division in Qatar. Next, let us shift our attention from Doha to Singapore, where I'm based. On August 9, 2017, at Singapore's National Day Parade, 29 Habitat smart coolers were used to cool audience members at different parts of the parade venue, designed to provide more energy efficient cooling than conventional air conditioner. The Habitat deployed at the National Day Parade were also modified to tap into the infrastructure of chill water supply of the district cooling network at Marina Bay. Habitat was developed by a team at InnoSparks a startup within ST Engineering, a publicly listed company that is also one of Asia's largest defense and engineering group. ST Engineering, in turn, has the Singapore government as the majority shareholder through its sovereign wealth fund, Tomasa Holdings. In the habitat installation for the National Day Parade, InnoSpark worked with Singapore District Cooling, a subsidiary of Singapore Power, a utility company owned also by Tomasa Holdings. First launched in August 2016 at the Mandai Zoo ticketing area, Habitat is a device designed to provide cooling that is supposed that was that is supposedly deeper than a typical evaporative cooler, and yet more energy efficient than conventional air conditioning. Habitat departs from conventional air conditioning not just in terms of the cooling technology deployed, but also in terms of the type of cool spaces created. Unlike conventional air conditioning, which tries to create constant temperature and humidity within a hermetically sealed interior, Habitat operates in outdoor spaces without clearly defined boundaries and thus create not a single thermal condition, but graduated zones of different air temperature and humidities. The National Day Parade is an annual spectacle that promotes national pride construct national identity and inculcate loyalty among Singaporeans. In recent years, it's held on a floating platform on the northern edge of Marina Bay, a water body central to the base branding of the new downtown and its southern edges. From the spectator stand, the skyline of the old and new downtowns of Singapore from the backdrop to the parade, the National Day Parade is thus a significant event on a symbolically laden site. The installation of habitat for outdoor cooling by two government-owned companies in the nation's most important public spectacle might be read as a shift away from its air conditioned modernity. Singapore has been called an air-conditioned nation by commentators in part because its founding Prime Minister Lee Kuan Yew regarded air conditioning as the greatest invention of the 20th century. A Cambridge-educated Anglophone elite Lee was influenced by colonial ideas of climate and civilization, particularly the, particularly the purported correlation between hot climate and the lack of civilization. Lee saw air conditioning as being critical to overcoming climatic barrier to social economic development. He famously said, and I quote, air conditioning was the most important invention for us, perhaps one of the signal inventions of history. It changed the nature of civilization by making development possible in the tropics. Without air conditioning, you can work well only in the cool early morning hours or at dusk. The first thing I did upon becoming prime minister was to install air conditioners in buildings where the civil service worked. This was key to public efficiency." End quote. The building type most representative of the emergence of the air-conditioned nation is the, model, is the modern podium tower block. 
it was stipulated by the state planning of uh, by the state urban planning agency as the main building type for Singapore's urban renewal program that began in the 1960s. The clear outlines and prismatic forms of these new high-rise podium tower blocks contrast against the fuzzy outlines and fine green textures of the old low-rise shop houses. At that time, the shop houses were considered as slums, dilapidated, congested, insanitary, and ripe for demolition. The post-independent state was actively involved in facilitating the demolition and replacement by modern podium tower blocks. In this turbulent rasa replacement of the old colonial shop house city with a new modernist city, the thermodynamics and urban metabolism of the city were also radically reconfigured. The old shop houses rely on structural solutions for keeping the inhabitants comfortable. These were integrated into the physical fabric of the building. The small courtyards in the middle of this terrace building let daylight in and promoted air circulation. These buildings were porous not just environmentally but also spatially that blur the boundaries between the interior and the streets. As the name shop house suggests, this were mixed use neighborhood combining commercial with residential spaces. The streets also took on multiple users as market, food center, and conduits for both pedestrians and vehicular traffic. They were fluid spaces where sweaty bodies intermingled. Podium towers are, on the other hand, much larger buildings that are hermetically sealed, creating an interiorized environment that have to rely on air conditioning and fluorescent lighting to keep their inhabitants comfortable. The boundaries with the exteriors are clearly demarcated and spaces are zoned for monofunctional users. During Singapore's urban renewal, most residential spaces were relocated to public housing in outlying satellite new towns. And many types of workspaces were transferred to industrial estates in the periphery, leaving behind only certain type of work and commercial spaces in the city centre, where sweatless body labour and consume in air-conditioned comfort. As the 1970s unfolded, many of the podium tower built were multi-use complexes, with the podium housing shopping arcades, upon which sat towers of offices, hotels, and all residences. Air conditioning transformed the interiors of the podium into what an advertisement called oasis of comfort for consumption. The air-conditioned interior allowed its operation to be unaffected by both the vagaries of weather and its diurnal and seasonal rhythms. Air-conditioned complexes soon became popular, and the new mega-complexes began to emerge from the 1980s. Among them was Marina Square, built on then newly reclaimed land on the northern side of Marina Bay. It was designed by American architect John Portman and built on the plot of land that was a few times bigger than the 1980s norm. It houses three of the architect's signature atrium hotels, which are essentially enormous hotels with rooms and assessed corridors organized around large, dramatic air-conditioned atria. At its completion, this atria was Southeast Asia's tallest, largest, and probably most spectacular. To the north of the Marina Square, to the north of Marina Square is another mega development, Suntec City, that was completed in the mid 1990s, consisting of 7 million square feet of air conditioned floor area. The development was serviced by a mechanical plant with the largest refrigeration capacity in Singapore and one of the biggest in Asia at that time. The five-story glass encased air-conditioned atrium in the convention center of Suntec City would later be featured on the cover of Sheeran George seminal book, Singapore, the Air-Conditioned Nation, turning it into a symbol of the tiny city-state's dependency on air conditioning and its politics of comfort and control, as the subtitle of the book suggests. The scale of these buildings, their vast labyrinthine interiority that connects at multiple levels to other large interior spaces in a seemingly endless manner echo the global emergence of a set of urban conditions that has been described as interior or volumetric urbanism, one that defies traditional figure ground, interior-exterior reading of the city. 
as we move into the 2000s, with the completion of the land reclamation project that formed the new downtown of Singapore, volumetric urbanism further consolidated around Marina Bay. One of the world's largest district cooling system was developed by the State Planning Agency, together with the aforementioned Singapore District Cooling Company as an integral part of the new downtown infrastructure. By turning the provision of chilled water for air conditioning plants into an essential utility service, the district cooling network contributed to the completion of more mega developments. With generic names such as Marina Bay Sands, Marina Bay Financial Center, and Marina One, that substantially enlarged the network of interiorized air conditioned spaces around Marina Bay. Singapore was for many years regarded as a post colonial developmental state that promoted economic growth through intervention at both the macro level with social economic policy and the micro politics of, among other acts, disciplining its population through the built environment. Thermal governance is central to the micro politics of disciplinary power. As Luis Fernandez Galeano argued, the disciplinary power in Jeremy Bentham's Panopticon was exercised not only through a spatial arrangement that facilitated visual surveillance, it was also implemented through careful design of the heating and ventilation system to keep the bodies of the inmate warm. In, in Fernandez Galeano words, a panopticon was also a pentamicon. In Singapore, thermal governance was, of, was often spatialized in the built environment through not just individual building typologies as we saw earlier, but also in urban planning to smooth the circulation of people and things by providing what a 1990s transportation master plan called all-weather comfort. Other than the case of vertical urbanism around Marina Bay with its multi-level internal connections, such air conditioned continuums are also evident in air conditioned transportation hubs and the various modes of connections between spaces. The air conditioned continuum is perhaps another way of realizing Lee Kuan Yew's 1990s dream of an air conditioned undergarment, so that in his words, I quote, Everyone can then work at his optimum temperature, and civilization can spread across all climates." End quote. Given that existing technologies at that time did not allow for the miniaturization of the air conditioner to the extent of being wearable, the next best thing to do was perhaps to air condition all the connective spaces to create a seamless, comfortable experience. These dreams, however, might be realized in the near future if claims of a few newly launched wearable air conditioners are to be believed. The above transformation of air conditioning technologies and built environment alongside the reconfiguration of comfort provision in Singapore and Doha are inseparable from the recent discussion of the global future of air conditioning. This discussion is captured in a widely cited 2018 report by the International Energy Agency, The Future of Cooling. The report highlights the threat posed by the quote, rampant growth in demand for space cooling with far reaching implications for emissions, energy security and electricity costs, end quote, and caused the threat a looming coal crunch. It warns that if unchecked, the global energy demands of air conditioning were more than triple by 2050, which will strain energy infrastructure and exacerbate climate change. Most of this escalation in global energy demands for air conditioning will take place in the global south due to the convergence of three types of trends, climatic, economic, and demographic. Climatically, the developing countries in the tropics and subtropics are projected to be more severely affected by climate change and would experience comparatively greater increases in temperature, leading to a surge in demand for cooling. Economically, these same countries are projected to experience rapid growth, enabling more of their populations to afford air conditioning. And finally, demographically, these countries are expected to have the fastest rates of population growth. From the report, the key challenge seems to be how do we bring about a social, environmental, equitable future of air conditioning without exacerbating climate change? In a way, 
the global cooling price launched in 2018. 2018 is seeking for a technological fix to that challenge. Organized by Rocky Mountain Institute and supported by the Indian government, the prize is a multi-stage competition with total prize money of 3 million US dollars in search of an affordable and radically efficient room air conditioner designed primarily for the hot climates of emerging economies. The belief that the panacea for all kinds of social environmental problems linked to air conditioning could be found in a technological solution is typical of the general technocentric approach adopted by policymakers. But this technocentric approach also lies at the roots of the problems with air conditioning, as it disaggregates and isolates the technological from the social, political, and material cultural entanglements, and reduce air conditioning to a technical problem to be solved by engineers and building technologies. Instead of taking a disaggregated, disaggregative and reductive approach to air conditioning, I would like to discuss the interdependencies between various constitutive parts that we observe in the two cases. I see air conditioning as a complex example from tightly knitted and deeply integrated components. Below, I seek to understand the air conditioning complexes of Singapore and Doha by exploring three related interdependencies of the social technical regimes of comfort, the techno politics of examining architecture and closure, and the thermal material entanglements of things in a human. Comfort, an oft taken for granted concept, is central to understanding air conditioning. Instead of air conditioners, the environmental services, particularly comfort cooling, that this air conditioner provides is the real commodity that is purveyed by the industry. This explains why thermal comfort is a standard that the industry sought to define early in its history. Indeed, today's global dominant thermal comfort standard, such as SRE standard 55 and ISO 7730, that determine the air temperature and humidity range of almost every interior air conditioned space, are based on the model and the method if not the exact parameters established almost a century ago by researchers sponsored by the American air conditioning industry. The concept of physical comfort expressed through what historian John Crowley calls the quote, self-conscious satis satisfaction with the relationship between one's body and its immediate physical environment, unquote, is a fairly recent invention. Crowley and others have traced the 18th century emergence of modern comfort in the Anglo-American and European context through the material cultural transformation of interior furnishing and improvements in heating, illuminating, and sanitary arrangement in domestic environment. In this account, physical comfort is a multi-layer concept understood in relation to context-specific social cultural practices and bodily interaction with a whole array of artifacts and environmental conditions. This social, cultural, psycho, physical concept of comfort is elusive and impossible to measure and standardize. The dominant thermal comfort standard that define the interior environment today are, however, of a very different conception. It is one that can be captured by a mathematical formula or represented by a graph, such as the one on the screen. This graph is from a 1923 paper, Determination of the Comfort Zone, which marks the beginning of modern thermal comfort standard, written by F. C. Horton and C. P. Yagoglu, two researchers funded by HD, American Society of Heating and Ventilating Engineers, and the predecessor of S3. The comfort zone was based, was based on experiments conducted in laboratories known as psychromatic chambers. This psychromatic chamber is a hermetically sealed room, affixed with an array of mechanical equipment so that the air temperature and humidity in the room could be individually manipulated for a whole array of experiments on thermal comfort to be carried out. It is also an empty windowless room, a veritable tubular rasa that is isolated and untangled from the messy multi-dimensional reality of attaining comfort. Experimental subjects were put into the chamber, crude to different extents, and asked to carry out various tasks, 
for the atmospheric conditions were varied and their physiological responses measured. From the voluminous quantitative data generated by these experiments, the thermal comfort zone was arrived at through statistical analysis. Undergirding the experiments and the concept of thermal comfort was the heat balance model and a mechanistic conception of the human body. The human body was reduced to a heat regulating machine and comfort was understood merely as a matter of balancing between the rate of heat production and heat dissipation. Horton and Yagoglu's comfort zone, which prescribed a narrow temperature range of around 20 to 23 degrees Celsius, a relative humidity level of 30 to 70 percent was lavishly praised by Willis Carrier, the quote unquote father of air conditioning and founder of an eponymous company that was and still is the world's largest manufacturer of air conditioner. Carrier claimed that the comfort zone quote proves conclusively that air conditioning does increase the comfort and shows to what degree the comfort is increased end quote. Historian Gail Cooper also argued that the scientific definition of a thermal comfort zone helped to construct markets for the fragile air conditioning industry because when the narrow air temperature and humidity range of the zone became the measure, natural climate was found wanting in its ability to consistently provide perfect comfort. Despite its continued dominance, the conventional thermal comfort model is not a challenge. In recent years, it was criticized for making air-conditioned workplaces too cold for most female office workers and creating what mainstream media call thermostat patriarchy. Such objections brought a, lo a long-ranging academic debate about thermal indices and model into the mainstream media. A group of researchers have long been critical of thermal comfort standards derived from controlled laboratory experiments. They have advocated the importance of few experiments to understand the situated practices of maintaining comfort. Using few data, they advocated for an adaptive thermal comfort model that has broader and higher range of temperature and relative humidity than the conventional model. In 1998, Richard Didier and Gail Breaker meta-analysis of 21,000 sets of few data convinced S-Ray to a minor revision of the standard 55. Besides adaptive thermal comfort, other interrogations of and deviations from the conventional thermal comfort standard include the borrowing of new thermal comfort model for meteorology and the design of outdoor cooling technologies that we saw in the earlier cases of Abitat, Musharraf, and Qatar World Cup Stadium, to the recent upward adjustment of thermostat settings in many countries to save energy and, re and reduce carbon emissions. Besides changing thermoset settings, the Kobe's campaign that was first initiated in Japan in 2005 but has since been ad adopted around the world, including by the United Nations, also introduced changes in office attire. Despite these recent changes, the long-term thermal comfort standard and conventional air conditioning technologies have introduced many fundamental interior, architectural, and urban configurations. They are not only still in place, but are also incredibly obdurate to any kind of changes, as we shall see next. Air conditioning technology operates by creating what James Marston Fitch described as, quote, a thermal steady state across time and a thermal equilibrium across space, end quote. In order to achieve a constant temperature across time and space, the cooling load has to be clearly calculated so that the capacity of the required air conditioning equipment could be determined and specified accordingly. Essential to simplifying and stabilizing the cooling load was to hermetically seal the interior and disconnect the interior air from the surrounding atmospheric fluctuation. The best known hermetically sealed built form associated with air conditioning is probably the ubiquitous prismatic skyscraper. The earliest example of this emblematic glass cladded air conditioned built form were realized in the late 1940s and early 1950s. They included the three North American examples on the screen the Equitable Building, the United Nations Secretary Building, and the Lever House. The latter two are especially iconic and were hugely influential in the global dissemination of the hermetically sealed glass cladded skyscraper to cities such as Singapore, Doha 
as we saw earlier. By the late 1960s and 70s, new building types with large air-conditioned atria, where the Ford Foundation building on the screen began to appear. The expansion of air-conditioned interiors, both in terms of the size and the types of interior enclosed, will be further extended into larger-scale urban environmental enclosures subsequently. Through projects such as indoor vertical farming and new walk by aero farms, and tropical islands near Berlin, geographers Stephen Graham and Simon Marvin argue that these encapsulations represent attempts at overcoming social ecological constraints of existing urban climates by creating enclosed engineered spaces with specialized microclimates for food production, ecological protection, and of course, human occupation. The enclosures also provide premium ecologies that serve as quote unquote secessionary artificial environment that minimize social and environmental risks to ensure the continued economic and material reproduction of certain segments of the population. Seen earlier in both Singapore and Doha, such enclosure and the new logic of microclimatic governance they represent foreground the thermodynamic asymmetry that reflects and accentuate broader social economic inequalities. Discussion of such large-scale urban environmental enclosures draw from Peter Sloterdijk's theory of amotopes or climatic islands. These islands are seen as capsules of three-dimensional isolation that invert the norms of habitation. In Sloterdijk's words, instead of erecting a building in an environment, a capsule is about installing an environment in a building. Sloterdijk's discussion of emotopes is a part of his theoretical explication of air, or what he calls his investigation into, quote, the remoulding of the life world into the life support system, end quote, by turning air from an invisible, immaterial background entity into an object of concern in the foreground of thinking about the relationship between environment, biopolitics, and political economy. By linking air conditioning to life support system, Sloterdijk's theoretical explication of air and those who draw from his work foreground the fact that the atmosphere constituted by air has a double meaning, oscillating between the biophysical and the social political. Atmospheric control through the conditioning of air affects not just the biophysical and the chemical properties of air, it also infects the political atmosphere and reflects the social political realities behind the thermodynamics involved in regulating the interconversion between different energy forms and thermal energy. At the larger scale, the control of urban metabolism, that is the circulation and transformation of material, energy, and other resources in the city, has biopolitical effects intimately linked to comfort, health, productivity, and well being. Despite the sophisticated and productive theoretical explication of air, the work of Sloterdijk and colleagues is perhaps not sufficiently attentive to the material realities and the micropolitics of hermetic engineering, as we shall see in the next and final section. The making of prismatic glass credit skyscrapers require not just innovation in air conditioning technology. As with any complex social technical assemblage, its formation relies on the convergence of an array of technologies. For example, without innovations that brought about fluorescent lighting, double grazing, or heat absorbent glass to reduce the excessive heat gain of these buildings, air conditioning a glass credit skyscraper would still not be commercially feasible. It even in an era of cheap energy in the mid 20th century. Besides cooling load, the glass curtain wall system of this prismatic skyscraper also presented other social technical challenges, such as problems with weather tightness. For instance, the UN Secretariat building famously leaked during heavy rain right after its completion. But when the water tightness issue of the curtain wall was resolved with subsequent technical improvement, the tightly sealed interior continued to generate its own set of problems. The most infamous of these problems is that of sick building syndrome, created by indoor air pollution within tightly sealed interiors. The challenges involved in creating such novel social technical examples contribute to the widespread adoptions of hybrid solutions that retain architectural elements 
or previous comfort regime during the transition from the reliance on the structural solutions of shading and natural ventilation to the dependence of power operated solution of air conditioning in the mid 20th century. Such hybrid solutions are evident in early air conditioned buildings in both Singapore and Doha. In Singapore, almost all the early air conditioned skyscrapers, as illustrated by the three examples on the screen, a relatively small percentage of raised area on the elevations, and these were well protected from solar radiation by sunshine. Likewise, in Doha, one of the earliest buildings planned and designed from the beginning to be air conditioned was the state hospital designed by the British firm John Harry's architect. Although the building was air conditioned, it was planned and designed to be cooled by cross ventilation in case of a power outage. The building's elevation was also covered with sunshades and verandas were positioned in front of the ward, oriented towards east and west to minimize radiative heat gain and prevent glare. The reciprocal relationship between things does not only occur between architectural components and cooling technologies, it also exists at a smaller scale and behind the envelope in interior furnishing. In the pre- and non-air-conditioned building, such as the shop houses in Singapore, lightweight porosity permeated the material culture across different scales, from the architectural envelope that consisted of adjustable louver windows and ventilation grills complemented by bamboo chip blinds, to the furnishing that consisted of airy screens and light timber and woven rattan chairs. Even the fabric used, such as bed sheets and curtains, were thin, light and breathable, just like the clothing the inhabitants wore. This system of things was a, material, was a thermal material culture interconnected and held together by the need to facilitate a particular pattern of thermal exchange, one that was about the movement of air through things, thus lowering air humidity level and creating sensation of cooling and comfort in a hot and humid tropical climate. The flow of air was frequently supplemented by handheld and electric fans, that accelerated air movement and potted plants that cool air through evapotranspiration. The subsequent introduction of air conditioning and the attendant alteration of indoor air temperature and relative humidity reconfigured patterns of thermal exchange and introduced a new interior thermal material culture. This is one of impermeable rather than porous surfaces of thicker, heavier and insulating material instead of thin, airy and conductive ones. It's an interior of furnishing, of furniture, excuse me, with heavy cushioning and plush upholstery, beds with duvets, and human in sweaters, cardigans, and business suits. The new indoor air conditioned temperature norm of 20 to 22 degrees Celsius, based on ASHRAE standard 55, did not just affect furnishing. Sociologist Elizabeth Schof has shown that it also become the standard to which other standards are calibrated around and which many features of thermal material culture evolve. These new standards affect mostly heat sensitive technologies with electronic components, such as computer, medical equipment, and the proliferating array of things with microchips, all of which are often designed to function optimally at around 22 degrees Celsius. This new normal also seeps into the design of unexpected and seemingly trivial, but consequential things such as chocolate. On the screen are two versions of KitKat that one can find in Malaysia. On the left, the version best enjoy outdoors, and on the right, the international recipe best enjoy in air-conditioned places. As we have seen, things are not inert and isolated. They are not just connected to other things, but also the human shaping their practices. The air conditioning exam wages create new material configurations and spatial arrangements that co-produce new social practices. Among the most obvious aspects of this new configuration are those linked to the redrawing of boundaries between the inside and the outside, and the hardening of those boundaries. These have direct impacts on the social spatial practices of maintaining comfort. While people in Singapore and Qatar used to occupy the threshold between the inside and the outside, at the porches and verandas, and in the shaded courtyards and alleys, to keep themselves comfortable in the pre-air conditioning era, 
they now mostly retreat to the interior to enjoy the air condition comfort of chill, dehumidified air. For those who feel too cold in the air conditioned interiors, but have to remain inside for various reasons, they do not have many options. If the building is designed to be hermetically sealed, there will be no operable windows to open. Adjusting the thermoset settings might be a way to alleviate the discomfort if the thermoset is to be found or if it's not locked by the building management team like the one on the screen. If both the above options are not available, the only options are perhaps to put on warm clothing or have hot beverages or food. The entanglements between things and humans are perhaps best summed up by Ian Hoddle, who notes, I quote, things depend on humans and that humans get drawn into greater labor and into a variety of response in order to keep things as they wanted, end quote. The tension between dependence in productive and enabling ways and dependency in constraining and limiting ways is one that continues to animate our interactions with our thermal material culture. Now it comes to conclusion, um, just a quick one. Uh, I started with surveys of Doha and Singapore, two air conditioning dependent cities located in rapidly urbanizing hot climatic regions that are projected to experience rampant growth in the use of air conditioning. Through the surveys, I've shown that air conditioning in these two countries were historically inseparable from the politics of built environmental management. In Doha, air conditioning was tied to the circulation of hydrocarbon and its conversion into petrol dollars and forms of energy intensive welfare provision of the oil state. In the case of Singapore, air conditioning was inextricably linked to the thermal governance of the developmental state. Through this survey, I seek to show that the use of air conditioning is irreducible to quantitative reasoning. And the solution to the looming coal crunch cannot be just based on based solely on technological formulation. By disaggregating the air conditioning complex into its discrete components and privileging the technological at the expense of the social, cultural, and political, this technocentric approach is inadequate in understanding why diverse cultures and various societies are becoming dependent on air conditioning and addressing how their cooling needs might be met with much lower climate impact. Instead of disaggregating the air conditioning complex, I propose that we explore the interdependencies between the parts through the three interdependencies of regime of comfort, exam bridges of architecture and enclosure, and thermal material entanglements. I seek to show how standards of comfort constructed through reductive ways of understanding human environmental interactions shape and were shaped by the forms of architecture and urban enclosure. This enclosure did not just regulate biophysical and atmospheric conditions. They also create an atmosphere in which social political relations are mediated. Furthermore, the built environmental enclosure influence while also being influenced by the energy flow and thermal exchanges between things and humans, transforming both material culture and social practices in the process. Although these are, the, these are but three of the many interdependencies in the air conditioning complex, I hope they capture some of the rich, intricate relationships between air conditioning view environment and society and begin to hint at how the looming coal crunch might be understood and dealt with separately. With that, uh, I thank you. Okay, well, thank you, Jeffrey. That, that was really fascinating. Um, great kind of scope, uh, very thoughtful, great detail. I mean, I, I'm fascinated by the way you, you shift between Doha and Singapore and you shift between you know, kind of aspects of history, some quite deep history, and the, and the contemporary. And really, before I open this up for questions, um, I just wanted to ask one uh, myself. I was really interested in that comparison between in Doha between Musharraf and Al um One, I guess we could call it high modernity, and the other low modernity. Uh, low modernity, I think, is a, is a really an interesting area that I think we all need to study more. That, that kind of ad hoc way of kind of adding, adding in technology to uh, a number of different kinds of structure. Um, but, um, and, and then later, very late in the talk, um, 
you touched on very briefly um, something I, I'm not sure if you call it hybrid forms of thermo, thermo, thermo comfort or mixed forms of thermo comfort. Um, and um, whereas I could see that high modernity and low modernity, you know, obviously have their, their histories, they, with, which we can trace and we can kind of contrast their, the, the, the way in which their kind of notions of thermal comfort kind of sometimes match, sometimes catch up, sometimes lag, sometimes are more specific. I was wondering about this later idea in the talk about these hybrid forms of thermocomfort and whether they too, whether hybridity itself has a history or whether you know, how we can place that vis-a-vis -vis high modernity, low modernity. Yeah? Yeah. Um... Um, Mark, that, that is a great question. Um, I, I think when we talk about hybridity, um, very often we might not um, look at the various forms of hybridity and then we, we tend to sometimes um, group different forms of hybridity into a single kind of a, a notion that exists somewhere between two pure forms or two binaries. And um, I think maybe that itself is a problem. So. When, when I move very quickly um, through different forms of hybridity um, between what you call low and high modernity and between um, hybridity ex as practice in, in, in the form of low modernity, if you like, and hybridity as design, in, as carefully configured and designed um, in, in, in the form of high modernity and also maybe in the new um, um, adaptive thermal comfort model that subsequently evolved away from the laboratory experiments. We, we, are, think, we are also talking about um, very different forms of becoming, if you like. And that process of arriving at those forms of modernity are, I think, equally important. And, and also, um, I think um, hybridity itself is always a very dynamic notion uh, in relation to both uh, time and also concept. What might be hybrid at a particular moment, but might subsequently be accepted and become one of the end of the spectrum in which another hybridity might form. So let's say if adaptive thermal comfort standard becomes the norm and becomes um, the accepted form of, if you like, high modernity, then um, I, I imagine evolving from that, uh, mixing between that design and configured form and um, in terms of practices and in terms of organically form of um, low modernity, what if, between the interaction between the two, I think will emerge another type of hybridity, I imagine. So, so I, I, I guess um, maybe what I didn't do enough in the talk and, and partly um, I did have enough time to do enough research at Ashma is to really trace um, how the settlements came into its current form. Yeah, that, that is something that are far too many gaps uh, in, in, in my understanding, and this is something that I hope to return and do more work on. Yeah. Yeah, fantastic. Thank you for that response. Now, let's have some questions or comments. So if you want to talk, just um, raise your hand, and then if I call on you, if you could t turn on both your mic and your, uh, your camera. And also, I'm going to continue recording. So, if you don't want me to record your part of the session, please please say so, and I'll stop recording and then start recording once you've talked. Okay. So, anyone want to come in uh, on this? I want to raise my hand. Yes, Ian from Jackson. Hi, Jack. We thank you for your for your excellent talk. It was uh, great to see all these uh, projects presented. I, I just wanted to speak to you about the ASHRAE building standards and the thermal comfort that they've been um, producing for the past century or so. We've been looking at a couple of buildings in in Kumasi and the Kra, and we've been measuring the temperature and humidity of these buildings. They're, they're the kind of tropical modernist style that we're familiar with. And we're trying to understand whether the tropical modernist style actually works. And by works, I mean, 
produces a comfortable interior because um, no one's actually measured it. So we're trying to see if it works, but also to find out what the inhabitants of those buildings think too. And we found from our survey so far that some of the inhabitants are comfortable at temperatures of around 30 degrees Celsius, even though the universities are planning to put in air conditioners that will reduce the temperature down to levels that you've been talking about, the early 20s. We even found that some of the occupants were cold or felt cold at temperatures of around 31 degrees C. So this was quite shocking. So we're, we're, we're wondering whether our data will be sufficient to drive new building standards and regulations that would be applicable to the West African context. I just wonder if, if any similar studies or approaches are being trialled or experimented with in the Middle East or in Singapore. Um, yeah, definitely, Ian. Um, one of the two persons that I mentioned who came out with the adaptive thermal comfort standard, um, his name is Richard Didier. He's a professor at University of Sydney. He, he, he got, first got interested in the topic because he came as a visiting professor to Singapore in the 1980s. And then he started measuring people who live in public housing, um, um, public housing, essentially high rise flats like, like one, I mean, like the one I live in. I'm actually sweating a little bit because I, I closed the windows to, so that I would not be disturbing my neighbors at this time of the night. Yeah, so I'm sweating a little bit. But but uh, what, what he did was that he, he discovered similar things as to what, what you found. Um, many of the inhabitants were fairly comfortable, especially at home environment with 29 to 30 degrees Celsius. So so he, he then asked this question, why is there this big discrepancy between um, field findings and laboratories findings? Because um, laboratories, they did the same thing. They surveyed the experimental subjects who went into this psychomatic chamber and then they tick certain boxes too. And, um, and, and uh, what was really interesting about Richard Didier was that he, he was originally trained as a environmental psychology so he he has some um, um he was equipped with some knowledge of that and then he started to talk about how when you have more control of your surroundings when you can open and close your windows when you can move around and not just be stuck to a workstation for example so in home environment especially the temperature the comfort range tends to be a lot broader so i mean i can i can link you I can link you up with him. I, I, I interviewed him when I was in Sydney last year and he's a very generous man. He's probably one of the best known building scientists around, but he's very generous with his time. So it might be worth um, talking to him if, if you'd like to, yeah. yeah that'd be great. Thank you so much. Um, yes, Jeffrey, uh, I mean, just while we wait for, 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 for more questions, I was fascinated to see that your, um, you know, that that, that Lee Kuan Yew um, uh, was, to, to my knowledge, the only leading uh, leading framework for whom um, air conditioning um, was such a feature of his social policy. I mean, it's. It, fascinating to think that and I wondered you know just, just because you extracted obviously a statement by him about it really how more widely significant it was than that I mean air conditioning for for him uh, it, it's clearly about work about the efficiency of working situations uh, which he also equates with civilization but I mean how does that do, can that be actually linked into a whole network of uh, policies or is that you know, kind of one-off statement what what is the significance of that as a statement about um about thermal comfort um interestingly um lee made that statement retrospectively in in, in the 2000s so and by that time um air conditioning is already really ubiquitous in singapore so it, it is really difficult to to know whether it is a kind of after the fact um, reflection on the early history of Singapore or whether was that what he felt at that time. But when I went to the archives, uh, what I discovered was that um, 
At that time, the government offices were based at an old colonial building called the Fullerton Building. And one of those things that um, has a big folder on is um, the installation of air conditioning, air, air conditioner, um, window units, air conditioner. And there was this long discussion between um, back and forth between the ministers and, 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 the, and the civil servants about who gets to have air conditioning um, in the room. And air conditioning was tied to seniority, it was tied to question of national security. So if you are part of the intelligence and if your conversation um, shouldn't be heard by people on the outside, then you have priority on air conditioning. And they also talk about the number of air conditioners they install. So this is the, the kind of, a, I mean, a part, fragmented um, historical evidence of that. But what is very evident um, is the very successful urban renewal program that literally um, transformed uh, the city center of Singapore. And um, in the urban renewal program, the building type that was stipulated, the podium tower type and the dimensions of this building meant that the only way this building could be cool is really through air conditioning. I mean, there is no way you can design uh, an atrium with, with shopping spaces and with that kind of depth with natural ventilation or with um, the usual technique of tropical architecture. So I thought um, that might not be, have been a conscious decision because that was in a way the global norm for urban renewal, but the scale in which it was carried out um, do suggest that there, there might be, if there's no intentionality, that but there might be, I mean, they are certainly aware of the consequences and they are fine with the consequences because there was no attempt to uh, pull back on the scale of um, urban renewal at all. Yeah. What about the, what about Singapore's famous mass housing? I mean, it, is the, the, did that did that have at some point was um, air conditioning um, brought into those, those those housing blocks? I mean, were there subsidies? Were there government subsidies? I mean, what what's the no? No, in fact, no. In fact, um, the early housing they were all designed to to to, to adopt the techniques of um, tropical architecture to have natural ventilation to have a very thin section so that cross ventilation is totally possible so there, there were no measures like that in fact the, um, subsequently um, they start to build holes into the wall to accommodate a window unit air conditioner and i read newspaper report of residents writing to the newspaper complaining that the holes were too small for some models of air conditioner so it was really um, gradual adaptation to, to, to a new technology. But what subsequently became very widely adopted in Singapore was a Japanese system of split unit that allowed for a single compressor on the outside and, and then for a tiny little pipe to bring in the refrigerant um, into the individual units. So um, I, I think there were some similarities in terms of housing conditions in dense Japanese city in Singapore. So there was a conscious technological choice of adapting that instead of the American system of a large kind of a central unit of air conditioning system. So that, that was the only thing I, I found out. Okay. So you don't know then where the workspaces were, were were given subsidies in order to bring air conditioning in to in order to make them more productive? I don't think workspaces were, were given um, subsidies but that is something that i should probably research yeah but i i don't think so we, we never have this policy i don't think singapore has ever had this policy of subsidizing electricity yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so so there's also this very i mean you touched on this fascinating uh, technology current uh, current technology um called air Batac, is it now what the, what, what do you um, say air Batac, air, air Air habitat. Air habitat. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. It's a, it's a weird word. It's a kind of a, it's a startup. It's a startup within a large engineering firm. So they, right. they, they concord new words. <laughs> right. So, so I wasn't quite sure. What, what, what is this technology? I mean, what, where does it come from? What's it based on? Is it, you know, what, what's your view of it? There's actually a very fascinating backstory behind the technology. So um, th this, this um, German um, 
engineering firm that is known to do that, that, that is known to be involved in some of the uh, high tech project around the world came to Singapore to advise the building of um, the two um, glass air condition um, uh, glass houses um, as part of the gardens by the bay. And then at that time they were roped in to, to design other projects. So they did a proposal that is pretty similar to Abitech which is essentially take an evaporative cooler, but the evaporative cooler typically doesn't work for a climate that has high humidity. Evaporative cooler essentially increase humidity, but, uh, but so it works very well for hot and dry climate, um, like some parts of India and maybe the Middle East. So hot, dry climate, it worked really well. So what they did is that they took that technology then they modified it so that uh, it doesn't increase the humidity that much. So it's taking the um, evaporative cooler but tweaking its components and then turning it into uh, a more efficient outdoor air condition. Right. So, so presumably you have groups of people gathering around these these, these conditions, yeah. To get yeah. People, and then they leave, and then they other people gather around, and then they leave. And, is that the way it, it works? It was interesting. I mean, it sounds a bit like, you know, our, you know, here we have these kind of heating units that you see pubs, you know, they, they put outside the pub so that, especially yeah. right now with the virus, people can have a drink outside the pub in the cold. Yeah? Yeah. I mean, is, is the effect of it actually somewhat similar in that, you know, they draw people to them, they yeah. put them down, and then they could, they, they might then draw draw back from them again. again. Well, yeah, absolutely. So there are there are these mobile things that you can move around. Is it rather like the radiator that you see in, in in Britain, for example? So except that in this case, uh, it is not through radiation, but it's through directly blowing out cold air. Yeah. So so its range is also limited in terms of. You cannot sit too far away from this habitat, otherwise you will not be feeling the, the cool air. So the range is pretty limited as well. Yeah. Okay. Anyone want to come in on this? Mm -hmm. Anyone got any any questions? I mean, you, you can if you want, if you feel as if you can't, you prefer not to speak, you could use the chat function um, if you have any questions. Um, I wasn't quite sure what what, what Slotted was doing for you, Jack Lee. <laughs> <laughs> the, the, I mean, I think you, you point out that uh, one of the, maybe the kind of conceptual um, um, ambiguity that I, I maybe didn't have time to really explain that. I don't know, I was, um, I was I was thinking about air conditioning and I was thinking about the politics of air conditioning and I was trying to trying to think about it uh, a little bit beyond the, the usual discussion of productivity and the direct causal relationship between comfort and higher productivity. So I was trying to think about how can we think of um, air, the control of air and the regulation of atmosphere as a form of our biopolitics. Yeah, so, so I was in the process of theorizing and obviously it's not very convincing yet of, of this idea of thermal governance. So I'm just wondering, um, is, that more, is there more to efficiency because when, when, when air conditioning is so ubiquitous and, and, some, and, and also I was responding to certain forms of uh, political commentary about how you know too much indoor living and too much comfort in cities that are addic addicted to air conditioning like Doha and Singapore have on the implication on the sense of a civic life. Yeah, so I was I was trying to connect a, a bunch of different things together. And also I was trying to write against slaughter that in a, in, a, in a more technical sense as well. Yeah. But, but you're right, um, I don't think it's, it's, it's doing the right kind of analytical work at this moment. I mean, the, the thing, I guess, uh, I mean, I'm kind of slightly puzzled why maybe it's, maybe you feel it's too, too kind of obvious a thing to say, but I'm quite rather puzzled by why issues of class and 
poverty uh, didn't come into the talk. Um, you know, because I mean, obviously, access to these, access to air conditioning, um, access to other kinds of thermal comfort, uh, thermal, thermal comfort technology. Indeed, the whole, if there is a history of comfort, then obviously it's a history of comfort that has, you know, kind of conflicting, contradictory and contesting uh, components to it that obviously would come out more if, if it was also a history of comfort in relationship to poverty and class. Um, so wh where is that? For you. Is that just so kind of obvious that it doesn't need to be said? I, I, I think um, maybe one part of um, the presentation that that has not been foregrounded very much is the question of um, comfort and inequality. So, so which is why I'm interested in El Ashmark, um, where the migrant workers live. Yeah. And also, um, one part of my research on Singapore that I've not really presented is people who live in public housing like myself. Uh, we actually did a few households a day. And what we really want to understand is, um, despite what has been called air condition nation and supposedly the ubiquity of air conditioning, um, many people live without air conditioning at home and um, they, they, they cope with it. So there are different ways of coping with heat. And, and I'm, I'm trying to understand it through the kind of um, different social economy classes and, and then try to understand that. Yeah, so definitely that, that would be, um, that I don't think one can talk about Singapore and Doha. And in fact, one of the, the great characteristics that both of them share, I mean, great in the, not necessarily in the great sense is that um, both are highly unequal society. Um, and I think that is maybe even further foregrounded by the COVID-19 uh, pandemic. Yeah, um, we Singapore also has a pretty large uh, proportion of our population. They are migrant workers, low-wage migrant workers, and they live in uh, very cramped dormitories. And that was where there was very big outbreak uh, of COVID-19 earlier this year. Um, I think the, the same happened in, in Qatar as well. So I think it is class, but in this case, class is also um, is also layered onto nationality and to some extent race. But race is a lot more complicated in, in this case, but certainly then the, the, the sense of insider and outsider of belonging and not belonging to the nation and thus um, whether they are entitled to some form of basic rights and comfort. Yeah, comfort can sometimes be elevated to the discourse of rights with, with um, questions of climate change and climate justice. So, so that is a much more compli complicated question that uh, maybe I'm not yet addressing. And also I'm not sure how, how to address it yet. Because when you talk about inequality, then the follow-up question will be justice. How do I talk about climate justice or, I don't know, I don't think it's comfort justice anymore because um, with climate change, um, the, 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 the level of mortality that comes from heat diseases and heat illnesses would, would really escalate. So that is that dimension that I'm, I'm not sure how do I talk about. Yeah, I mean, there are, there are of course heat waves in, in many countries and heat waves is seen as a disaster, partly because the mortality rate spike. Yeah. yeah thank you. Um, Albert Brunstrat uh, here. Uh, he's one of my PhD who I know is very interested in this, this, this kind of work. Um, Albert, have you got anything that you wanted to ask that we, or, or indeed anything concerned with your own research? Because I think you, you and Jeff, obviously you both worked on Koenigsberg, for instance. I wondered if, Albert, you had anything you wanted to ask that we, well, while he's here in front of us. Well, thank you, that's me for the talk. Sorry, I had to leave because I had a meeting. I just came back, so I really don't know what was being asked or anything. Um, and I don't know, I thought you, it was so inspirational. And I thought there was many things that were coming to mind 
in relation, I'm really not thinking of Konigsberger or of the architects, but of thinking of the petrodollars and the power of those words that you're using in thinking of migration, movement, uh, international exchanges of CO2, etc., and how that is shaping so many other things. But one of the things following what you were talking with Mark, I was thinking there's something about the architecture of air conditioning that requires other standards, other needs of cleanliness, of, of, of maintenance, that is quite different to the maintenance or the cleanliness of something. And it talks about, I wonder if you had some thoughts about that. So it's not so much, I guess, the poverty of the construction, but the poverty of the lift air condition building. Uh, well, that was one question. I think that makes sense. Thanks, yeah. Th thanks, Albert. You're, you're absolutely right that um, in terms of maintenance, in terms of the, when, we, when we talk about infrastructure and I see air conditioning as a type of infrastructure, not in the sense of a large scale infrastructure in itself, but uh, kind of an infrastructure that infiltrates on everyday life. Any kind of infrastructure requires maintenance. So you're absolutely right about how um, the kind of um, uh, intense air, air, air conditioning uh, requires not just electricity to, to run this air conditioner, but also frequent maintenance. But I think there's also another kind of a reciprocal effect in that many people install air conditioning in, in, in the tropical and hot and humid com, um, context of Singapore, for example, to maintain things. So, for example, to maintain the paintings that they keep, to maintain a certain collections of um, stuff that they have, and also um, very often living in a city like in Singapore, whereby it is congested, I mean, and, and also polluted to some extent. Um, when you want to have natural ventilation, it means that when you open the window, you don't just get the breeze, you get the dust, you get the noise, and various things comes in. So sometimes, Air conditioning is not just used for comfort, it's maybe used for acoustic privacy, it's to use to keep the interior clean and to, to minimize the other forms of maintenance that is needed. And also um, sociologist Elizabeth Schof and her colleagues have shown that um, air conditioning is sometimes used um, in hospitals and in clinics because um, they need to maintain um, the very delicate the medical equipment and they need to maintain it at room temperature. Many of these delicate medical equipments um, are opt uh, operate opt optimally at room temperature. And the new room temperature that we talk about today is the air conditioned room temperature of between 20 to 22 degrees Celsius. So, so there is a kind of complicated relationship between human and things and, and sometimes it becomes reciprocal and, and it works in this weird kind of connection. So I thought that that is the other dimension that I really appreciate about uh, Elizabeth Schultz's work. And also when we did our household interview, we talked to people about the usage of air conditioning. Something that came out very frequently is acoustic privacy. Uh, because you live in a very dense environment and if you have a gathering, for example, you might be disturbing your neighbors. So people like to shut off their windows. And when you shut off their windows, the only way you can be comfortable is to really turn the air conditioning on. Yeah. Can I can I follow on that? Yeah, uh, because you, you were mentioning, I was thinking when Elizabeth Shaw, I've heard her addressing architects, I think she's challenging them to challenge this, um, I forgot the name of, of but this, this idea of the 22 degrees or the 21 degree. And the last time I saw her was, please do buildings where you have to live between 10 and 35 degrees, so people have to get used to that. I think it was very I don't know, quirky, but I think it was quite funny. But it made me think quite a lot about the health of the spaces that you're mentioning. And for example, at least in Spain, we have lots of problems from time to time, air conditioning and all the health related issues in hospitals. So uh, maybe I'm going to say something stupid. Uh, salmonella. I don't know, there's some kind of uh, bacteria, viruses that appear in air conditioning in polluted environment. But I think with the coronavirus, we are questioning lots about this immunity to the bacteria and the immunity of 
these spaces and clothes. And I, I wonder to what extent those things that I might take from shows might, you know, contest that or this doesn't make sense in a city like Singapore. No, I, 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 I think it makes perfect sense. You, you are absolutely right that um, by sealing the building from the outside, it creates a kind of an internal ecology. And um, Michelle Murphy wrote this wonderful book on uh, sick building syndrome, and it's very much about that, about how office building, when, when, when the envelope became tighter and tighter after the 1970s energy crisis, whereby um, they, 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 they changed the airtight standard, um, and then buildings become even more sealed up. Um, it then creates a kind of an internal circulation of microbes and of human beings and of bacteria and of various things, um, creating unexpected kind of um, secondary, what, what, what they call secondary ecology. Yeah, so, so absolutely. And, and I think today we are witnessing this again. I mean, there are various kinds of studies, not terribly conclusive, but I, I was very interested in the topic about air conditioning and COVID-19 as well. So I tried to read a few of these medical studies are published. I mean, I only managed to maybe understand 20% of it, but then there are, there are all this um, discussion about how air conditioning system contributed um, to, to the spread of to the spread of COVID-19, yeah. So, so definitely, yeah. That, I mean, that that is the other dimension to think about. Thank you. Thank you. So, presumably, is that? Do you think that reading those studies, the air conditioning's relationship to the spread of COVID, is is that to do with just the fact we have to have a sealed, um, a sealed space, or is it to do with air conditions recycling? Okay. I, I think I think it's more to do with air conditioning recycling the air and also uh, without um, natural ventilation um, the, the bacteria get trapped within the interior environment yeah even though so for example if for I, I was told that um, for hospital wards that need to treat COVID patients or for laboratories that are dealing with the, the bacteria itself, they need to create a negative pressure within the laboratory or the hospital wards so that there's no danger of even of air leaking outwards. So I guess in I guess that is for hospital, but in a normal environment whereby someone might have COVID-19 and um, the air then get recirculated and the air doesn't get the, the I mean, the, I, I think the exchange of air might not be that great. So that the, the bacteria that get trapped within the interior, I don't know. I don't really know enough of the, the technicalities of that, but, but I'm just imagining um, the circulation of the air, the confined spaces and um, the, the last possibility for the bacteria to, to escape. So even in non air conditioned interior and, and there are some videos of that done um, to demonstrate in terms of how droplets um, would, would be able to spread further or would, would um, remain in the space for longer. So maybe it is only partially to do with um, air conditioning. Maybe the other part is the whole question of spatial, spatializing or enclosed spaces. Yeah. So, so I think sometimes we need to untangle this part and not to conflate them into a single um, caused by air conditioning, yeah. but that is difficult. Yeah. Okay, are there any more questions? We've got a diminished group in, in size now, so perhaps before we diminish more, I want to thank you, Jadby. That that was really fascinating, and with so many so many interesting kind of connections and and resonances, including of course your last points. It's it, it's kind of really interesting to think in a sense to to think about all of this for me and also take it back to you know the the importance of sanitation and hygiene and colonial planning as well you know um which you kind of touch on early early on in in the talk and then bring that forward to think about you know kind of COVID-19 and air-conditioned spaces and it's really really interesting 
and you know, kind of very important work I think you're doing. What are you planning to do with this? Is this going to be a book or what? I'm trying to write a book, but um, it, it is currently very fragmented, and um, I'm I'm not sure what kind of book is going to be. I'm trying to add another city. I, I'm not maybe I'm maybe I'm too 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 greedy, but I, I'm hoping to do some work in East Asia. Yeah, so I, I'm not sure whether I'm trying to take on too much or should I just focus on what I have and, and just do a book. But I, I do plan to publish one or two more uh, journals because and see where where everything goes. I, I still have a current ongoing project with a group of colleagues from the social sciences and the humanities with the STS group uh, looking at um, urban heat in Asia. So I might continue to do a bit more work on air conditioning with this group of people with existing funding. But currently um, doing overseas work is not possible due to COVID-19, we can't travel at all. So, so that is something that I'm not sure as well. Yeah. Well, it would be good to you know, be good to see to see to see these things and to see a possible book. I mean, one feels that there's an urgency, isn't there? You know, that your research is touching on so 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 many things, which obviously we have to deal. With. We have to kind of deal with both on a personal level in terms of how we work and live, but also on a high political level of governance and. So, you know, it'd be great to see, see your work coming out. Okay, Jack, we thank you. Um, good to see you. You're looking healthy. It's a bit sweaty, perhaps, now that it's getting late. <laughs> <laughs> I'm feeling cold myself here in, in, uh, in London. Uh, so I've got the heating on, actually. Um, but thank you very much. And I hope to see you soon. And, and keep well. We'll keep in touch, okay? Thanks for having me, Mark. Yeah, it's, it's a pleasure. I'm so glad to be able to share my research with everyone and to have this wonderful discussion. So, so thanks for having me as well. Thank you, Chapu. Take care. Thank you, Mark. Bye-bye. Thank you, everyone. Bye-bye.